a new, exciting open source blockchain platform has been born. Its core mission is to develop easier and more affordable tools for everyone to be able to create tokens and NFTs. For the first time, we're introducing the innovative Tokel platform, a fully decentralized community-driven project with contributors globally. It offers many new powerful features for artists, content creators, and event organizers, and token owners. Tokel is building the future of tokenization together with the help of Komodo Technologies. Creators and users have the freedom to create, to hold, buy, sell, and trade tokens with ease. Developers have the freedom to build on top of the platform's layer. Tokel has features such as simplified token creation tools, token decks, and NFT marketplace. The NFT creation process has an extremely low barrier to entry. Businesses and individuals can now benefit from the token economy by using tokens in everyday life. A built-in decentralized exchange enables peer-to-peer -peer trading. Tokel.io, the future of tokenization to NFT and beyond. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Tokel Talk about the future of tokenization. It's September 11th. 2021. I'm Giuliano, and we have quite a bunch of voices here to talk, have a nice roundtable type of discussion about Tokel and more broadly tokenization and how Tokel might end up fitting into that uh, coming landscape. Well, I hope you're all doing well. And whether you're joining us live here in the Tokel Discord or on YouTube or any other platforms, and whether you're joining us uh, recorded because of other reasons. We thank you all for joining. Yes, again, hope you're doing well. Today, we have a, a range of topics to cover, and we'll get an update about the Tokel IDO. Also, if you want to put in any chat, ask any questions, and you can join the Discord or, or chat in any of the platforms there and ask your questions. As well as, um, you know, we have these, these people here that we might not have heard from before on one of our Tokel live streams. So I'm going to immediately uh, introduce here for us, we have Andrew from Pirate Party of Australia. We have Zulu. Uh, NFT enthusiast and uh, community member, and hash rates from Etho and BPSAA. We also have Dream Tim here and Nutella Lika. So that's just my short, quick introduction. I'm going to allow everyone to introduce themselves. We'll start in the same order. So we'll hear from Andrew, the Pirate Party of Australia. Uh, Andrew, hello. How are you? Who are you? And uh, What's going on? Um, hello, um, my name is uh, Andrew Downing. I'm the current policy development officer with the Australian Pirate Party, based out of Sydney. Um, Pirate Party is a it's a global movement, really. Started out in Sweden some time ago, and uh, it's represented in many countries, including Australia. We are generally about things like uh, digital rights, uh, civil rights in general. Um, we concern ourselves with things like intellectual property. Uh, we're very much an online, uh, democratic, sort of very transparent sort of organization. You can come along and talk to us anytime. Um, but I'm particularly myself interested in the, the development of the whole cryptocurrency space and particularly the, the new sort of organizational structures that are emerging from that over time. So that's pretty about it. Very nice. Thank you for that introduction. And we're very excited to have you here, especially hearing that. It sounds like you're fitting right into, uh, it's like you're jumping on this moving train with us for those of us hearing from you for the first time. So thank, thank you. you so much for joining. Yeah, thank you so much for joining uh, us, Andrew. And we also have Zulu here. Zulu, why don't you introduce yourself now? Hello. Hello, Giuliano. Uh I hope the sound is better now. Uh, I'm Zulu, as you previously said. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here for the first time. 
am uh, based mainly in Europe and I'm, uh, I'm an enthusiast uh, of uh, uh, art. That's uh, why I'm very, and my implication in these uh, new projects with the NFTs and tokenization. So glad to be here with you. Thanks. And thank you too. Thanks for joining us here. Um, and also hash rates now. We, uh, if you're familiar with hash rates, then it needs no introduction. Uh, but uh, please, hash rates, why don't you introduce yourself for us today? Yeah, good morning, everybody, and greetings from South Florida. Uh, quick introduction I've been doing IT for about uh, 25 years. Um, I have a consulting company called Blockchain Soft, building M uh, MVPs. Uh, on blockchain um, based technologies primarily for corporate use and 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 enterprise adoption um, also um, my nickname hash rates obviously because I'm a miner I did a lot of mining early on and uh, with that I found I ran into Etho protocol which is basically a it's a hosting platform uh, based on ethereum technology and IPFS got elected to the community there and I go I spend my time there as a volunteer uh, uh, it's an open source platform. Actually, we have uh, NFTs being built on our platform. We're not primarily an NFT uh, a solution, but we are a, um, a, 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 a road that NFTs can be built on. So we certainly like to um, support NFTs anywhere they are. We believe in the technology. We think it's an important part of the cryptocurrency future. And then finally, with that uh, Etho protocol, we were one of the founding members of the BPSAA. I would put, like to put in a plug in for them. Uh, it's bpsaa.vision. Um, it is a uh, an organization of about a, I'd say when we're coming up about about 10 or 11 projects now that represent the best in the cryptocurrency space. And we try to focus on um, adoption and education and let's say uh, individual and, 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 and user rights uh, in the uh, blockchain cryptocurrency. And I'm on the board of directors there and a member of the BPSAA. So a uh, rather broad spectrum of background here. And I'm excited to uh, Talk about uh, the, the big picture here for NFTs going forward. Very excited as well to have you here, Hash Raids. That's so nice to, to have you for sure. And um, we also have Dream Tim and Nutella Lika. Uh, you know, they are watching closely the Tokel IDO. They also have uh, an update and information about these Tokel um, time lock rewards uh, based on the IDO. So we're, we're going to hear from Dream Tim and Nutella Lika now. And just a reminder to you, if you want to check any of that, they'll share with you the website, tokel.io slash IDO or slash reward. Nutella Lika, hello. Dream Tim, hello. How are you today? Hey, Juliana. Doing well, thank you. Yeah, excited to have everyone on. We've got a, uh, a wide a wide range of you know knowledgeable people here, which is, which is awesome. And I'm keen to to discuss all things tokenization. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining us again, Juliana. It's my pleasure. So Nutella Luka, can you catch us up then uh, briefly on this uh, Toko IDO and then talk about that time lock rewards? Yeah, just quickly, uh, we're just over halfway uh, through the, the RDO uh, main phase, uh, phase two. So the RDO will finish on the 15th of September. We've currently sold uh, 2,178,000 tockle uh, out of the 20 million. So there's still quite a considerable amount there. But uh, as you kind of mentioned, we've released the, the early adopter initiative, which is the time lock reward plan, where uh, for any of the, the tockle that aren't sold, they're actually going to be airdropped back to tockle holders uh, over a period of time. So um, say we, we don't sell 15 million tockle, that 15 million tockle will be airdropped proportionally to the 5 million tockle holders, um, half of it will be airdropped in nine months and then half in, in 18 months from uh, the end of the RDO. So um, hopefully people can wrap their head around that and what that means to them. Um, would recommend going and reading the Medium article, but if uh, if you have currently purchased tockle and you'd like to know how much you know potentially you could receive in, in the future there, then you can go onto our website, which is just tockle.io slash rewards. Um, so basically, you know, the less that sell, the more that the people that purchased get uh, in the long run there. So uh, hopefully uh, people are happy with that. But yeah, that's uh, that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Nutella Lika. And uh, Dream Tim, uh, hello. And 
I hope you enjoy this conversation too. At any point, if you want to jump in, uh, please feel free to share your thoughts. Okay, so speaking of, oh, hi, Dream Tim. Yeah, you want to say hello to all the people, don't you? Yeah, hi there. Hi, everybody. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll start off with just generally real world, real world use cases. Um, and we can start, maybe we're going to go over towards hash rates here. Uh, hash rates, I'm just going to ask this question. Uh, what are some real-world use cases for tokens that you are interested or excited for? Interested in or excited for? Well, um, <laughs> that's a, that's really, um, as they say, what do you say? Two edges to a sword, right? I mean, I have, I have, I look at it two ways. Again, I, I'm kind of a different cat here in the whole crypto space because of my IT background. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. And... I haven't, you know, I, I, I always look at it from more of a practical standpoint and primarily really business orientated, which has been frustrating because honestly, um, blockchain technology at this point has really not broken out um, at the enterpriser or, or business level. It's been, and I thought it would have by now. So, you know, I look at this NFT um, and I hate to call it a bubble, but you look at this art world, right? Where everybody's at and it's art, art, art and, 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 and things. And there's a lot of people making a lot of money at it. I mean, it's it's stunning, shocking to me. Um, and maybe it's because I'm just old and I don't think right and I don't understand the, the vision of it. So I see that part of it in the crypto part of me, the crypto hat. And I say, that's really cool. Look at everything, what everybody's doing. Tokel, other technologies out there to be able to make NFTs easier to use, which I like. Because, you know, trying to deploy an NFT has been, it's been around for a while. Like OpenSea, right? Those guys have been around for a long time. But only recently have they got any traction and new platforms like you are coming to make it easier for people, which I think is great. So then you say to yourself, well, how long is that going to go? And then the other hat of me, which is the enterprise space, which is where I think the future of NFTs are um, primarily for digital digital digitalization of assets. Um, I got involved um, with a with a project that never got off the ground. We didn't get funded called AeroChain. And AeroChain was basically tokenization or NFT of aircraft parts. There's a big problem with, with, with fake aircraft parts in the industry. Um, the Chinese, no offense to the Chinese for anybody on the call, but they, uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of fraud, artificial parts. They're fake. Um, they get into the supply chain. Um, they, get, uh, they get sold as authentic parts. Um, the part fails. And if you have a part failure on an aircraft, it be, could be catastrophic. And so, therefore, um, the entire, you know, aerospace industry is, is really interested in having authentication of originality of parts for the limitation of liability and failure, right? And so I look at that and I say, oh, my God, this is obvious uh, how important, you know, this type of thing can be. So that's where I think the future of this technology will be. And maybe I thought it'd be getting in here now, but it's not. Maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years. But the tokenization of assets in general is, is going to be explosive. Every asset will be tokenized at some part. And so then you say to yourself, well, how do we get from crypto kitties, right? The very first NFTs that made a splash to, to you know, generator parts on a Boeing 737. And there's a lot of space in between the crypto kitty and the Boeing generator. So, and then saying, how do we get there? And what I will think will happen will be, you will have NFT projects or NFT technologies that will focus on very specific industry or use cases. And the generalization NFT platforms will go from very horizontal to very, very vertical. And that's where I think the future is. And, you, you know, who does what for what vertical, I think, will be a mix of traditional technology and traditional players mixed with new high tech players that could bring the blockchain and the tokenization assets. So how's that for a, uh, a broad answer? Brilliant. Yes. Well summarized. Very, very well summarized. We really appreciate that. And, um, and now that also leads me next into with Zulu here. So thank you, hash rates. And Zulu, um, there was a mention about CryptoKitties. Um, you're very much into art. How does your uh, view of the power of this art movement of NFTs how do you think that that continues forward? 
And also, you know, what, yeah, like, are there any other real world, world use cases uh, surrounding that art for yourself? You are in it, so you are going to be using it. So f- for you, in that way to, to put the art forward, is that the case? And in, and in that way, um, have you been using the, the uh, like OpenSea was mentioned, are you using those platforms? And what are your thoughts going forward? Like, what do you see as being some needs that need to be served for the artists in this, uh, the uh, NFT space, tokenization space? So Zulu, if, if that question makes sense to you, um, please take that and go with it. Yes, thank you. It makes a perfect sense, actually. And Hash Rates explained it quite well with the examples he had in the aviation. And this is something amazing to to hear actually we've heard something like uh, tokenization of uh, gold like the gp morgan bank in america is doing right now or i don't know even in the real estate but for me, uh, the fds or the non-fungible tokens uh, represent the most popular examples uh, of the application of uh, tokenization uh, the basis of blockchain, of course. Uh, these are very suitable for organization for the art assets that cannot divide you know, into small units um, or exchange with the SML right. I still hope you hear me well. So, for example... So, uh, sorry, uh, I did, did, you were cutting out there a little bit. I'm not sure if that was like that for everybody, but uh, Zulu, maybe if you, if you speak a little slower there and... Um, uh, maybe it'll come through okay, a little more, more clear, hopefully. Try. Thank you. I would just try to do that and to be as short as possible as well. So I was giving you this example. Uh, you know, it's difficult uh, to divide the ownership of a specific piece of artwork in the real world. Let's think about how it was of Mona Lisa or of Bunyu of Castle, you know? And what the, the tokenization facets nowadays is doing is exactly this thing. I'm really sorry about the this sound. So uh, for me and for any individual purchasing a, a piece of artwork would get complete ownership over the artwork. But uh, however, this tokenization can transform uh, the conventional precedence easily. The, you can have a piece of ownership of the nowadays. Uh, the artists are uh, having uh, this uh, perpetual royalties in these new platforms. You know, I'm sure the castle would love to to have, I don't know, his uh, grand grand uh, sons uh, receiving in their wallets a piece of uh, royalties he will get reselling over his arts, his hundreds of arts. See, yeah. Okay, so yeah. So it sounds like you're talking a lot about ownership and then even like shared ownership and then also uh, royalties, revenue streams that can be associated with ownership. Is, is that correct? Thank you for summarizing this, Giuliano. Sorry for the uh, sound. Okay, yeah, no, we'll just... yeah, no problem. But uh, oh, well, good. yeah, that no, that gives that gives a good a good interesting perspective too, because uh, we're definitely coming up against um, theories of ownership these days and the property. And uh, Andrew had mentioned property rights, I believe, in intellectual property rights specifically. I believe that was you. Um, and so, Andrew. Uh, what do you, what do you think about this in terms of some real world use cases coming forward, or that you're excited in, uh, interested in, and um, bringing that in towards like the everyday citizens that don't understand blockchain? Maybe you are interacting with a bunch of people that that don't understand what's going on. So how does that come into play for you as well? Uh, yeah, I think um, we're going to see a bit of a revolution in the way that uh, ownership is thought of. I mean, traditionally, you had a physical object, you owned it or you didn't own it, and that was that. As we get into the sort of you know, digital rights sort of realm, things change. You can slice and dice the concept of ownership in so many different ways. 
and it's more perhaps correct to talk about it in terms of property rights. And so when you have a tokenized system to represent your ownership of something, then really it's representing the uh, the, the range and interaction in all the different ways that those property rights can be expressed in relation to your participation with a particular thing. And you can have multiple people owning things in parts. Do they own it in common? Do they own it uh, jointly? Um, there's a whole range you know, of you know, things that are like that. Like you already kind of have in property, you have the idea of tenancy in common and tenancy and joint tenancy as, as different concepts in law already, but that ends up applying to a much broader range of properties, right? Um, there all, this also applies down to all sorts of odd different levels. Like if you think like a, like a, a building or something, you, you might own a building and yet the, you, you hand off the right to lease it out to some leasing agent who manages those things and then they lease it to somebody and the person who has a lease has in fact some property rights over the building or at least some parts of that, the parts that they leased, and a bunch of rights come with that, right? So these things get passed down a whole chain of, uh, of, of rights that you then have that end up being you know, legally recognised in some way. The legal systems are nowhere near accommodating the stuff today. Um, so there's a lot of change that's going to have to be adapted to by governments to, to accommodate some of that stuff. Um, so there's that. No, there's other interesting issues around just, say, copyright. Um, one of the things that happens in copyright today and say, the music, you get this problem where um, uh, the social media companies, YouTube, whatever, you know, have to comply with things like the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, where they have to uh, accept takedown notices by you know, would-be copyright owners to say, ah, that person's you know, stolen my stuff and published it and you need to take it down. But the problem is that gets abused because um, they don't have to provide, provide proof that, you know, with the DMCA notice, they don't have to provide proof that they were, in fact, the owner. And so the system gets abused by people who simply don't want a bit of content to be up because maybe it's their politician and maybe it's critical of them. And they'd rather just get it taken down while the media storm blows over and then later on people dispute the claim and it gets put back up again, by which time it's useless. So, uh, you know, the news day moved on, right? So having a, um, a more defin definitive, you know, authenticated uh, method of establishing ownership gets rid of that loophole. It means that when you um, submit a takedown notice, you could actually express that, well, look, here's the certificate showing I really do own this content. Now it's legit. And if you don't front up with that, then your takedown notice is maybe not so legit and maybe should just be ignored. So things like that, I think, turn up. Yeah, I'd like to chime in on Andrew's point. For the geeks in the room, we call that DRM, which is digital rights management. Um, and there's a lot of, and that in itself is a whole other technology. There has been an extraordinary amount of work about integrating DRM with blockchain um, for that use. And I cannot specifically point to a, a overall success case but that DRM, digital rights management, for 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 use of either audio, video, or or print materials, everybody believes that blockchain technology can be the saving grace for that. But at this point, there hasn't been an installation that has broken out. So if any of you are geniuses out there, put on the uh, try to figure out a way to get. DRM to work with blockchain and you'll have a billion dollar solution. I haven't figured it out yet, but I know there's a lot smarter people than I am looking at oh, that. So Ash, Andrew makes a good point. Can I just respond to that? I have to say that uh, having been around um, copyright and DRM issues for some years now, basically none of the existing DRM systems really actually work in block blockchain or not. They have a fundamental structural you know, design problem in that they need to put both the rather uh, the encrypted data and the key to that data together in the same place at the person that actually wants to view the material that they paid for. And given that you're doing that, there's no way to actually um, hide that ultimately. And uh, adding blockchain to it doesn't solve the problem. So the the real issues that I think can be solved in this space are really just in terms of um, making 
usually if you just make it easy enough and cheap enough to obtain the material, most people are happy to comply with it. And uh, if you have a more direct relationship with the with the artists that produce the work, people feel way happier about uh, forking their handing their money over. So you know, I'm quite happy to you know to throw a buck if I know most of them made the music. I'm less happy about it if you know 99 cents on the dollar goes to some middleman company that you know claims the rights mm. to the stuff and the musician doesn't get it. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking you're talking like the peer to peer aspect of it. Uh, yeah. Is it more that, flattening? <laughs> that changes the nature of the uh, the transaction considerably, and being able to establish that they were the true owner then um, makes a lot more clarity in the uh, in the world in the in the legal framework and takes these loopholes out of the way andrew you make okay. an excellent you make an excellent point there as you said they haven't put the two together now i'm going to throw something out there which is you know really esoteric and it's a little bit probably beyond what toko wants to do today but what about obviously we're talking about this with our own rights, right? If they say, if the products are free, you're the product, right? I mean, that's what they say with Google now and Twitter and everything else. What about NFTing ourselves? What about the hash rates NFT or, or my other personas? And as I go about this digital life and being able to have the monetization of myself and my own personal data, I've never thought about that. We've talked a lot about being able to have personal rights on the blockchain and controlling your rights. But does that mean we turn our own in individuality, digital individuality, into an NFT that could be monetized? I mean, how's I think, that for a strange concept? Yeah, I think I've actually, yeah, I've read an article that somebody is trying to do that for like marketing rights. They're trying to, you know, digitize themselves for, you know, and sell themselves in a way, I suppose. But the the idea of digital identities is also an interesting concept that's being uh, that's being tackled by a Komodo um, ecosystem blockchain called Verus. I know they have what they call Verus IDs, where you basically have that digital identity on the blockchain through their their ID system. And I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I know they're trying to look into that issue and have tackled that issue a bit. So it's it's definitely an interesting concept. And the game theory on that would be pretty pretty interesting to see where people go. Hey? Yeah. Can we morph that into an NFT though? I think the thing that's interesting about the NFT concept in general, right? And that's our discussion is everybody kind of starting to get it, right? Everybody understands it's a little piece of this digital world that you live. Whereas you think about monetization of individual rights or, 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 or whatever, it gets a little bit strange for people to wrap their heads around. But if I can say, hey, this is my hash rates NFT and you can borrow it or use it or monetize it, it seems to maybe connect the dots. Again, I know this is a really far out conversation, but since you know the Tokel is an NFT platform, and I know you're not doing that today, but is that something down the road that would be interesting is is providing a platform for people to NFT themselves? I, I mean, I just put it out there for discussion. I'll just comment there that um, I, I think it sounds out there when you describe a person as an NFT like that, but really it's just identity management, right? We, 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 we talk in the um, crypto space generally a lot about you know, anonymity and so on. But um, in fact, there is scope in all sorts of different projects for the whole spectrum there from totally anonymous type transactions through to the totally human identified with a real world human identity and everything in between. And so if you just express this in terms of identity and then NFTs are an implementation of identity because it has the same criteria. If you want to have an NFT that relates to a physical thing in the world, and you need to be able to authenticate that in some way. With if that thing happens to be a person, well, sure, it's the same deal, right? It's just the the method you go about, uh, you know, really doing that authentication may vary when it's a person. But uh, we already have that for things like you know KYC and so on. That's expected by many governments. They want to all know your customer. It's identity, and then you want to attach a variety of you know interesting things that the person cares about to their identity because these are the things I want the world to know about me. Yeah, yeah it's interesting yeah. you mentioned that. And okay, go ahead, hash rates. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, Andrew's got spot on. I love his views, right? I mean, he, he, he's, he knows enough about cryptocurrency, but he's far enough away from it that he can take a broader vision. And so I, I would also say with regards to blockchain technology in general, and let's say NFTs is what, what Andrew said is the fact that, right, we're all in crypto, right? We have these 
these these these these these anonymous wallet addresses that we hide behind and nobody knows who we are and this is what makes crypto great we know that that's the antichrist for the establishment right and i and i'm a libertarian right i want my personal privacy and i i don't want everybody to know where i am or where i go but at the same time right at the same time i believe the the breakout of 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 cryptocurrency blockchain technologies and ft will actually be the public side of the equation we all hide behind the private side we hide behind the anonymity we hide behind these these wallets that nobody knows who we are because we want we value our privacy and i think that the holy grail of this movement maybe 5 years from now or 10 years from now is when we've managed to decentralize ourselves we've managed to own our own our own individuality whether we monetize that or not and it will be more public i think that that is kind of the chasm that we look at as an industry is that we're all hiding and we're trying to stay hidden and i think that that over time is not going to work i think there's going to be a balance between your public identity and your private identity and using blockchain technology and nfts and others to be able to protect yourself from the centralization of these gigantic services that m- monopolize our our data and and maybe like i said the nft might just be a a a way to be able to 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 mass produce that or mass market these technologies rather than all you know uh you know uh, all these the, the the crypto speak that we have i don't know again but interesting to a lot yeah. i think it's spot on mm. i was just respond to that as well um the the issue of identity and wanting to maintain your privacy like that i think in some ways is strongly incented by the the centralizing power of you know government authorities and private companies like social media companies and so on who want to you know, abuse your information so you know, creates this impetus to want to protect your privacy but of course once you make a decentralized system half the point of that is to remove that potential for monopolistic behavior and control from that central position so it gets rid of a large portion of the impetus to want to hide yourself like that and the flip side of having a decentralized system is that the purpose of it is decentralized trust management you're doing trust engineering that's what these things are for and you can't have trust engineering without some kind of identity because people need to know who they're dealing with and what the reputation is and whether they have history of delivering good stuff for good prices and making other people happy that they've negotiated with in the past and so on so identity is fundamental to this it's about trust engineering excellent and excellent change. yeah well that's that's very I'm so that's interesting that we've gone here and um, because I think we are talking not just about uh, Tokel and NFTs specifically, but we're talking about the world of human, how NFTs play into that. And it says this has gone to identity because at the end of it, like you said, we are the humans interacting uh, with each other. And then you mentioned with corporations and governments and other powers. And you're talking about blockchain identities and Natalia Lika, uh mentioned Varus. And so in that note that you're talking about, because you also talked about like public and private uh, with the Varus ID that's revocable and recoverable uh, on chain, um, it has this. It, so anybody can look Merkle Mountain ranges that they use in order to provide the information you want and keep everything else private. And then, so I think that solutions like this are uh, coming. And um, it's interesting that uh, we get to have this discussion here. Um, so shout outs to the, to Varus for, for the ID work that, uh, been going on there for some years and, um, it's already on mainnet. So everybody can check that one out too. Um, yeah, this is incredible discussion and I, I mean, I'm just blown away already at the, the ground that we've covered. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to bring us back around a little bit. Uh, of course, unless anybody wants to continue uh, on down that road, um, but here, maybe the question becomes, why would people make the switch to these blockchain-based tokenized assets or recognition of ownership? Is it just a generational thing and how technologies move forward? And as the generation uh, comes up, then it's just going to be part of it? Or what do you think? How do we move forward with that? So, guess, um, and yeah, go for it, Natalia. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess like my my thought on that is we need to we need to make it easier than and uh better than the current systems that they have available to them so somebody's not going to 
in my opinion, somebody's not going to make the change if it's more difficult and it isn't as good, if not better, than the current systems that they're using. I think the biggest challenge that we'll face as an industry is the the points that we've already kind of talked about, which is the legal system accommodation. So how how are the systems that people live in going to accommodate this decentralized technology? And I like, I, I honestly don't know how that's necessary or that's going to happen. Uh, but I think that's going to be a big step forward. And I think that's probably a question for Andrew and and to get yeah. his his thoughts on it. But how yeah. How does he see, you know, public policy uptaking decentralized technologies in general, but also, you know, further that to um, the tokenization of assets, and then how to how does public policy recognize different blockchains that have different use cases, but they're all decentralized in a way with parts of centralized parts of each one of them. Um, some some answers I have for that, others I'm not so sure just yet. We're working on it, but. Um... For from a first sort of principles thing, um, governments have effectively already recognised um, decentralised assets just because tax departments decided that they wanted to be able to tax capital gains on assets that were crypto assets. So, as a matter of course, they've already recognised them to that extent. Just about every government has done that. Um, the more specialised things are going to depend upon. Um, you know, individual bits of legislation. So if you wanted a tokenized representation of actual you know, land property ownership, then that's going to replace an existing government department. I don't think that's going to happen in a hurry because there's a lot of too many people in the existing institution that are by that. By that. Uh, you might see that sort of stuff emerging from smaller countries where perhaps they don't already have a well-established infrastructure, maybe the African nations or something, and those sort of solutions might establish themselves over time and then other governments might migrate once it's already a proven, you know, a proven established thing. But uh, ownership of other things that governments don't typically um, you know, bother tracking today because it's too expensive or inconvenient, um, uh, other bits of property that you own, um, that becomes more of a private concern. Governments don't already have a stake in that, so it'll probably just happen in the you know, government, um, legislative, uh, whatever, you know, backing of that will probably backfill later. Governments are always slow. They they follow the, uh, they, they lag behind the technological change and sort of, you know, backfill to justify or regulate where things look a little bit dodgy uh, after the fact, so... That's the yeah. typical trend there. Yeah, so it's going to be a, a slow move process, and there's going to be niche areas of you know different industries that are going to change what they do slowly over time. And it's you made an interesting point there that you know these systems are already in place, um, like governmental departments. I suppose they're the they're already in place, yeah. but it's um, a centralized. Or yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly right. And and to uptake a decentralized process would be incredible movement to do. Well, there's a lot of connections. I, I can to... chime in on uh, on a, a, just a very quick exercise on on that here in the United States specifically. I certainly can't comment for other countries, but in, in I, I looked on I worked on this project with IBM in 2017, very very early on when they birthed uh, Hyper Hyperledger. So, in the United States, there's I think around 4,000 counties in the United States. The title to property in the United States is held at the county level. Every county in the United States uses a different system. If you were going to have a property management tokenization system, you'd have to maintain 4,000 individual interfaces in the United States. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. Or, or um, one blockchain. If you could get 4,000 counties to all agree to use that, and that will never yeah. happen you yeah. know, because of the way our, our structure is. So it looks great on paper, and I would love it. Um, but every time we started looking at those type of things, at least from a small, like I'm a small consulting company, it's impossible. And even IBM couldn't move the couldn't move the needle on it. So I love the you know for for practical things like for Tokel, right? If, if who knows where the platform's going to go, but I would say that is a one entrepreneur to another, focus on the private sector that can move fast and quick. Try to get a beachhead on some type of market, whether it happens to be art or specifically art in an art market that's specific, you know, some type of whatever would be a much better um, success case than going after broader things. I know we're really not talking about that, but when Andrew was talking about, you know, governments and, 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 and property and all that, it, it's so beautiful of a solution, 
but the entrenched establishment, I think, is going to make it almost impossible. We, you know, uh, I don't it's, know. It's, it's not it's just ugly. the entrenched establishment of the actual office there either. It's it's all of the other functions that go into that, right? Because spinning off of that, there are a whole lot of you know, very socially integrated roles. There are you know, land surveyors. There are court orders in relation to the land. There are um, uh, what, what do they call it? Um, uh, the things where there's you now land access rights and a whole lot of other complexity that goes around this, you know, and if a, oh, yeah. if a police officer goes out to enforce a thing, or how is he going to find out and what's his involvement with that? If there's a lien on the land, if there's mortgages which relates to banks and there's, there's bank interfaces and or whoever is financing these things, there's, there's just so many complex interacting moving parts that are very, very connected to different departments, institutions, individuals, their job roles, and so on. It's a massively complex system, so it's not just a identity ownership piece. Yeah, for sure. And every time you add a different layer, of course, the complex mathematical is exponential for the layer that you add, right? And you just talked about police and land surveyors and, 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 and all these other things, let alone liens and bank liens. So you multiply those 4,000 counties by each layer that interfaces with it, and you've got billions of combinations of interfaces to be able to implement the system, yeah, right? Yep, it's, I'd say it's find bad. an easier find an easier problem to solve first. Yeah, right. Exactly. Let's stick with art and Tokel. Yeah. Well, I think your your point about going after uh, like private businesses that can move fast and change what they do, and and basically, you know, change. Like, well, the example that you you talked about earlier on is similar to the example that. I've kind of discussed previously. So you talked about um, the authentic authentication and originality of, of aircraft parts. The example that I like to use that is easier for people to understand is is um, you know how it, what an NFT NFT could do is for a car. So you have a car. It comes out of the factory. It's you know blue. It's you know got this chassis. It's got this engine number or whatever. But it it gets stamped a VIN number on there. So the VIN number is the the car itself so that vin number could be a token id of that specific car anyway long, long story short if a car manufacturer or if tesla for example or any you know forward leaning sort of business started to to take their cars and turn them into nfts or tokens then they would start to get that recognition and get that discussion going to you know, then eventually start talking to different government areas to say hey this token id we've got all the information it's already on the blockchain you don't need to ask People just need to put in that token ID and everything's already there. No, oh, and, by the and way. That, is, that is going to happen. And and so, you know, my participation here, uh, when Dream Tim asked me, hey, would you like to talk, you know, chat? I said, sure. Is that that's going to happen for everything. Everything will yeah. be token. Everything. So 100%. the idea that this NFTs is, has anything to do with artwork is 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 like the first star that ever happened in in in, in the cosmos, right? It is only... The most micro, smallest step going forward, the, the, the tokenization of assets, every asset will be tokenized. Every asset. I truly believe that. Everything from cars. Of course, now they're even doing driver's licenses, but that's kind of an ID thing. But, you know, every asset. So it, this market is, is massive. It, it is absolutely incomprehensible, the size yeah. of this market. So I'm, I'm excited okay. about the technology. I completely agree, and I think the the art step is the easiest thing for people to understand. And it wasn't even that easy for people to understand in the first place, because people are like, "What? Well, what's an NFT? Why would somebody want to buy digital art? They can't make that step." You know, so, I'd, you know. I'd say one of the uh, one of the biggest um, generic markets that's probably going to open up sometime soon is just generically the supply chain space. Because what happens today is that if uh, any large-scale supply chain solution typically emerges from some monopolistic company at the center of it, it might be, I don't know, GM, General Motors, they make cars, they set up a supply chain system and they use their dominant position to uh, own and occupy and run that supply chain system. And then they have a whole lot of, you know, vassal companies that surround them, that supply stuff and deliver things and warehouse things and so on. But they direct affairs and they use their monopoly to control that, which is kind of, uh, it's an awkward position for anybody who is not them, and they kind of tend to uh, use that position of dominance to monopolize and make everything their own interests. So 
what's on offer as a possibility with the arrival of a tokenized solution to supply chains is that you can have a supply chain system that's independent of any monopoly like that, where the uh, the engagement with that system is all kind of role based. It might be that you come along with a facility to go, oh, look, I can I can supply warehousing in all these locations. Someone else says, yeah, look, I can provide uh, you know, delivery services in these locations. Someone else comes along and says, well, look, I can supply all these different kinds of parts to this quality, these specifications for this price on this timing. And other people come along and go, oh, well, yeah, no, I need a regular order of these things. And what you have in the middle is a logistics system that is decentralized and that integrates all of those roles together to produce the outcome you want. And nobody gets to dominate that. No one gets to monopolize the center of it and tell everybody else that their role is somehow you know, lesser or is to be controlled by the monopolist. That actually makes a much fairer overall system that people will ultimately want to participate in. And it's more efficient. Yeah, I really, I really like that from that that decentralization aspect but what it does is it changes the way we can incentivize people to do things and participate in things and be a part of groups and yeah um, people you know biz- want to participate when they see yeah. that it's fair they want to see fairness that's part of the whole um you know negotiating around trust it's trust engineering you set up those relationships and people can see what the relationships are they can see it's a level playing field and so they want to participate yeah, hundred percent. That's a very really interesting point, and, and and that's a point where where you know this technology can also fight corruption, and there comes a question then: how easy it will be to convince people who are corrupt and using corrupted systems to endorse you know tokenization and blockchain technology, will, which will stop them in their tracks. You don't have to convince them; you convince everybody else, and then they have to go where the money is. That's the beauty of the decentralized system, right? Is that everybody, you know, it empowers the people, which is, you know, blockchain technology as a whole. So it comes back to, you know, decentralized uh, tokenization using that blockchain technology. Wow. I, um, we're really, yeah, we're touching on all these points, uh, you know, how, how tokens can change incentive structures and, you know, the importance of the decentralization and what that actually means. Go ahead, Nutella. No, I like, I've, I remember hearing this example, and I might butcher it a little bit, unfortunately, but um, just the the idea of a token economy, and it's nothing, you know, nothing mind blowing, but it just gets people or got me thinking about how tokens can be used as uh, in society in different ways, shapes, or forms. But the the idea that you know, in a city, say, there's a bunch of people within a certain community that really want to create a green space within that community, they can all you know pool their funds, um, purchase a, a block of land, but then how do they manage that block of land? You know, how do they stop people going in there? How do they keep the upkeep and all those sorts of things? So what, you know, what they could do, and they could use all sorts of different technologies for this. But if they wanted to do it in a decentralized fashion that has open markets and open order books and the ability to free trade whenever they need to, is they could tokenize it. Um, you know, using Tockle for example, um, they could tokenize it based on you know the amount of money that you put in at the start. You get that proportion of the token, and then. Uh, all that money goes towards creating that green space. It, it, you know, they might have some sort of screen at the front that says, "Hey, you need to pay X token to enter and actually use the green space." So, you know, the people, um, the people that want to use that green space already have those tokens to then enter and use that green space. But what does that, you know, entry fee do? That that pays people to upkeep that green space. So then they have this pool of of tokens there that they can then allocate to, you know people that want to use their free time to just keep that green space uh, available and, and nice and, you know, um, cultured, I suppose. So mm, I like that like, idea. That's, a, there's that's like, very incentive advising. Yeah. Yeah. There's like this circular economy there that's all decentralized in nature. And, you know, say, say the people that were living in that community that paid for that green space no longer want to be a part of that. They can then go and sell those tokens, you know, privately or on the open market based on, you know, the current price that people are willing to, pay to enter because if somebody that doesn't live in that community wants to enter and utilize that beautiful green space they have to to pay the entry fee which will then be purchasing the token you know submitting that token as soon as they enter the door and then they're good to use that that green space but anyway that's just a simple example that i thought you know i like it help, yeah, helped and me understand 
Yeah, people can also onboard by doing them work. Then they get the, the they get it and can use it. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. My, it's really- my advice to 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 token platforms, Tokel or others, would be this: is to find a vertical market and dominate it. And I would try to move out of the art space as as quickly as possible for your business model. Right? Everybody understands art, as you said. They get it. It's an easy place to start. Um, and but I, I think that the greater tokenization is all these other things that offer, whether it's green space or again or other things. But I, I think from uh, this is you know hash rates wearing his business hat in business development. You know it's it's there's more and more tokenization platforms popping up every day. Everybody's piling into the crypto kitty thing, and I use that generally speaking about art. Not that there isn't a lot of legitimate art and some great use cases, but that ex- uh, example used there is very unique. Right. And, and, and there may be a use for that. And if you only did all the green spaces around the world, Tolkien would be a gigantic, successful project, whatever that may be. And, and again, I would I would give that advice to anybody that I talked to that was that was trying to build solutions in the NFT platform. Perfect. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for that advice. Yes, indeed. That's amazing. That's a sorry, Juliana. That's a really good point there. And I think that I like to discuss, you know, the whole idea of NFTs is that that artwork is that layer, not layer one, but it's poor use of words there. But like that layer one, people need to start thinking about that next layer, which is really that that authentication, that identity, that ownership piece. But then also like there's other, there's so many other use cases for them that are, you know, interactive NFTs. So we haven't even brushed on, you know, the video game space, which is, I guess, a part of that artwork space, but it's slightly different. It's offset, but the the way that, you know, video games can, can um, foster these decentralized economies using tokenization where people people have ownership over the games that they play because they own the tokens and they own the items and that's that has real world value to the people that play the games um, so that's the next step of like you know these interactive tokens and then you know the the far-reaching step is where the world is completely tokenized as hash rates has already kind of said so Might there's different layers in, there. in, in that game space you actually can probably think about that as being like your sort of canary network, right, where you can go and try out all sorts of different tokenized structures and arrangements and collaborations between people in a space that's relatively safe because, you know, you're only playing with small amounts, but people kind of care because it's game tokens, right? But you can do all the game theoretical playing around and experimentation in a space like that until you find the systems that work before you start transferring them into the the, 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 the broader world of goods and services and so on. When you know your methods, you've tried them out in the space. So it was, you know, I say like a canary network. If you follow yeah. what I mean, it's a safe yeah. space to try it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right on. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is good. And, um, you know, I think we've covered quite a lot of topics here. You you just started talking about the video games and um, just these ways of introducing peer to peer economies with this entertainment mixed in. And I don't know, like if anybody has any thoughts on that, uh, please take them forward. Um, Zulu, are you still there? How's it going with you? Yeah, I'm listening to this. Uh... Fantastic uh, debate, actually. Uh, audio, I think, is still terrible, and I really want to ease your ears and not uh, disturb you anymore with this. So we hear you quite fine course. right now. So if you wanted to share a thought, <laughs> oh well, maybe then it's gonna. So just wait, and then you speak slowly, and um, and then we'll move on to. Okay. I thought I'd throw another comment myself, things. if you like. Yeah, but just thinking that. One of the things that we're seeing at the moment is a lot of the you know, things that look a bit bubbly in the in the crypto space in general, I think are actually a result of the very loose monetary policy that's been going on outside there in fiat land. So there's a lot of cheap money floating around and that's turning up as, you know, it's, it's looking for a home. And so it turns up in all these sort of bubbly kind of places. You get very bubbly behavior in the share market and the same as it turns up in the kind of crypto market as well. And that tends to express itself in the extremes as, um, call it uh, trading behavior that looks more like gambling, right? So people buying, you know, dog-themed meme coins and uh, or ridiculous prices for you know, NFTs and things like this that have no connection to 
anything of you know ground level substance or persistent long term substance. So that stuff I think is going to be you know with a period of time where that's great that can kickstart your business and get you going in that space. But uh, you want to use the window of opportunity you have that that gives you to um, to build more solid long term structure. You know, structural sort of solutions that are going to give long-term value and be able to build and construct on those things uh, because that's the stuff that will like, last you into the long term and the, and the speculation stops. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that that's definitely what we're trying to do mm-hmm. at, at Tuckle here is we're trying to build that foundation layer so that you know people can people can come along and do as, exactly as Hashrate said and dominate those vertical markets that they they see the opportunity in we you know at Tockle we're basically trying to provide all of the technologies available and make it easy enough for people to just pick it up and go and and go and you know yep. create the tokens in different areas win. yeah yeah so that we're not trying to you know dominate all of those verticals we're trying to provide the the infrastructure around all of that and and try and incubate and facilitate all of those projects coming along and doing that obviously we're going to have to showcase how how that can be done in certain ways, and we might try and you know push it up a certain vertical. But the the idea is that anybody can come along and create, trade, manage, buy, sell, um, manipulate like their tokens as they see fit on our platform, and yeah. it be inexpensive and easy to I use. There's going to be need to be the emergence of something like I've been a software engineer, such an architect for like forty years or something. And one of the things that turns up in that space is this idea of design patterns, and they turn up a very different kind of level of thought, really, in, in software development. And one of the things I think that's going to need to emerge from this is if you're doing trust engineering with a blockchain, then you need to establish a range of like known established design patterns in trust engineering. And the way it is, the game theoretical stuff about how different groups of people get to interact and the ways that, that you can do that such that you maintain trust. And there'll be a whole bunch of patterns to that and you'll end up encoding those patterns into the base layer so that people can just, oh, yeah, we want a pattern like that. Only the entities yeah. involved this time are these and these and these people and you build interfaces around it suitable for the particular vertical and off you go. So I, I would be looking for the emergence of that sort of thing. Trust in yeah, that, design patterns. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And like that's going to take a lot of, uh, different applications to try and prove those concepts and find those patterns in order to then be able to, you know, give that to other projects or other people to be able to use in different verticals. Yep, absolutely. So we had talked about these big ideas. Uh, what what kind of timeline does this look like for any of us just listening on the sidelines? And we're like, oh wow, this sounds amazing! I can't wait. Uh, well, what, what what does this really look like in in you know on a day to day, week to week, month to month, and year over year thing? I remember towards the beginning of the conversation, hash rates had mentioned about uh, five to ten years ish, um, and that was maybe you were talking even specifically just about the aviation um, parts. Um, so, do you have any thoughts, uh, Andrew, about timelines or? Even Natalika, anybody else too? Yeah, I'd say that um, throughout the sort of you know, the rest of this year into early next year, probably we're going to see uh, a lot of noise, general you know song and dance stuff going on, but we probably won't see any really major big rollouts of anything you know, massively significant. It'll be spot things in perhaps some little verticals here and there where people you know, manage to find a quick win, but then we're going to go into the Kind of the, you know, you know that the whole you know, blockchain market in general, cryptocurrency market in general, has this big four-year cycle driven by the Bitcoin thing, right? And so we're probably going to see a long downtime in between there, where everything slumps for a while, and during that time, everybody does the hard work, and then you'll find that when things resurge and there's a big flow of money back into the market again, probably somewhere around 2024, 25. Um, then you'll see a whole lot of people who are really poised and ready to go at that point because they've built all their infrastructure and they've done all the hard yards and then the money starts flowing in and big things happen. So I'd expect to see huge advances around that time. 
but all the hard work, the hard yards will have been put in in between and it'll just be, you know, like just grinding, putting it out there and doing the hard things. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a difficult, you know, the hype, you see, you see you know, the, the Gartner hype cycle, everything, we're in this hype cycle, the hype part of the hype cycle, and then we all drop down into that what they call the trough of despair where everything's a bit, oh, well, the great promise of that didn't, it's, oh, it's all very hard, we have to do hard work now, and you'll spend however many you know, years flowing on from that, building the relationships, because partly building relationships is building skill sets, it's building infrastructures like your, your structure here, and that stuff takes time and integration and uh, political change and regulatory change and adapting to all those things, and it's always going to be slower than you expect. So I would be looking for a big change around 2025-ish. Nice. I think from a uh, to bring that back to like a Tuckles perspective then and just where we're currently at, um, for the people that, that aren't aware or new to Tockle itself, we're currently in the, the audio phase of, of the project. So we have the underlying blockchain technology and features are all there for uh, you know, our, our first kind of big lot of features, which is you know, being able to create and trade and buy and sell tokens in a decentralized on-chain fashion, uh, which includes you know, the token decks and NFT marketplace. But We've got all those features there on the blockchain right now, ready to go. But not many people know how to actually, like, actually run a full node and use those uh, API and commands. I, I, I should, um, you know, um, clarify my point though. Um, I'm, I'm not in any way rain, trying to rain on your parade. There. Oh no, no, no! A large scale market yeah. movement perspective. Yep. This, this, this stuff takes a long time. No, no, I was just trying to... Again, politically. No worries, Andrew. That was, yeah, that was completely <laughs> understood from your point. So but yeah, thanks for, for making sure. Yeah, no yeah, problem. Yeah, I was just trying to trying to relate it back to where, where we are, I suppose, based on what you've kind of just mentioned there. That wasn't a actually uh, rebuttal. Yeah, that was good. Though, point. That, that was good. <laughs> keep, keep going with that. That was good. We actually, I was appreciating that you were uh, putting us back into the perspective of Topol, uh, since, you know, this, we are here on the yeah. Topol platform Topol Talk uh, about the future of tokenization. And so I think also we deserve to hear a little bit and we probably are interested to hear a little bit of what you were saying. So if you did have anything else that you were going to continue yeah. with there, just do that. Yeah. 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 No, we're, uh, we're definitely in that hard yards, uh, hard yard space, like in that, in that, that place where the developers are, are working like mad to try and, you know, create these proof of concepts and, and what we're, you know, as I kind of mentioned, we've got the blockchain layer there, which we're, going to continue to to um, develop and change as, as the community sees fit and as you know as people have different requirements we'll do that from a layer one perspective but uh, we're really working on on getting that proof of concept out out there which is is our decentralized app application which will showcase each of those features you know having the the toggle coin wallet in it plus a token wallet which you know any token uh, that's created on on the toggle blockchain you'll be able to just be able to see it if it's in your wallet it'll be right there so if you create it bang it'll be in your wallet we'll have that token creation page which will be a, a tick and flip basically for people to go down and type in name supply description put in a bunch of arbitrary data if it if it uh if they need to do that for whatever application they're going to be using it for uh, and then click create and bang it's in their wallet um, and then also the the token decks and nft marketplaces where people can uh, trade those in a decentralized fashion on with uh using an on-chain uh mechanism there so that proof of concept uh application is what we're going to start with and we're going to try to finish that by the end of the year but then we'll, we'll start to look at those you know uh, as andrew kind of pointed out earlier we'll start to look at those ways of finding patterns in how this is going to work and how people can really grip it up and and use it themselves and we're going to open source all of the the decentralized applications that we create and then start to work with projects to try and facilitate their use cases and then you know change toggle as we need to based on the people that are using it because it's a community you know a community run platform and we want to take in into account all the projects that are actually going to use use the technology that are there and try to help them out as best we can so um, we're we're definitely in that you know grind stage very very early stage which you know Andrew pointed out is going to take year, a couple of years to really get into the swing of things and start you know picking up steam and picking up pace through those normal market cycles so can i throw a design times. pattern request for you <laughs> you want to yeah. this one 
Uh, one of the things I notice out there in the uh, in the, you know, the, the existing financial world is that I think we mentioned earlier the idea of you know, tokenization of things like gold. Um, there's actually a lot, uh, there's a sort of analog equivalent to that out there today, which is that um, you know, what they call paper gold, right? A lot of the gold that's owned in the world, it was all stored in vaults somewhere, but there's all this paper representation of that and people are trading the paper thing without ever claiming the real gold. And there's, a, there's an effect that happens in that world, they call it rehypothecation, where effectively there ends up being multiple different claims on the same chunk of gold, all operating concurrently. And it's kind of unresolvable. So if everybody wanted to claim their gold at the same time, it wouldn't work. Um, and, and this effectively um, inflates the entire space. It's, uh, and it, become, it can become a bizarre way to sort of attack that market and devalue the underlying gold, which is a strange thing to do, but it happens in the real world quite extensively. So what we could really do with, and that, oddly it actually also, that actually, that effect largely emerges from the way that futures markets are implemented. So what I'd really like is if someone came up with a good way to have tokenized gold in which that can't happen, in which yeah. there's like a singleton connection between the token and a piece of gold nice. somewhere that is dead. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up this uh, gold rehypothecation problem and the tokenization. This is uh, this is great. I didn't expect it to go there. And uh, why not, Natalika? What are you I, saying? Yeah, yeah. I um, not to like plug them at all, but the the Perth Mint, one of the biggest it's in Australia, actually have digitized their gold reserves. And although it's a a centralized form of doing it by a digital coin, not I don't think it's a token per se i'd have to look into it a bit more i haven't read too much into at it at but... the same time they stopped guaranteeing that you could take the uh euro gold ownership in actual gold and have it shipped to you they broke that contract for oh years. there you go but most yeah. of the history you could always exchange your rights there for actual gold and they cut that out a little while ago so yeah i guess that's still a centralized system as well it is and, and you have to rely on them to, you know. Yeah, just got to believe then that they have the gold. We really have the gold. Yeah. Trust us yeah. because look, we're the mint. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll um, I got a question for hash rates. I guess to answer, um, to ask him the same question that Giuliano asked earlier about the timeline on, uh, you know, this technology being picked up by, by mainstream, by the world, by business, you know, enterprise. What sort of, what sort of timeline do you think that's that's got? Um, yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> I, I, I was smiling when you said, oh, I think we're probably at this for a couple of years because a couple of years in this space seems to be incomprehensible, right? So if I put on <laughs> yeah. my Etho protocol hat, right, you know, we are our own fork of Ethereum. We're integrated with IPFS. I'm very active there, right? I mean, that's my baby. Not that I birthed it, but I, I came on board late, but I really love it. And I find that our community, if they don't constantly get fed something new on a daily basis, they leave. It's, it's, it's insatiable appetite for a delivery of something fantastic every single day, let alone two years. So it, it's funny. So the crypto world, two years, you could forget it. You'll be dead in two minutes if you don't deliver, right? And it, and it, and it sucks because we're trying to advance this technology beyond this instantaneous gratification that everybody wants in crypto, the next Dogecoin for your project every day. And if you're not doing what Doge does, they go and they find the next one. And that's like 99% of our users. It's very sad, right? You know, yeah. of our community. Yeah. So the two year thing, I love it because that's real. But in the crypto world, it's you might as well give up because nobody's going to wait, right? So that's one side of it. Now, the flip side where I put on my business hat, and this is the challenge that I face for my side business with the consulting is, is the problem with blockchain technology in business is there is no definitive ROI model. And because I cannot demonstrate an ROI using blockchain technology, nobody wants to make the leap. I'm engaged deeply with a Swedish telecom equipment provider, and I'm not going to get the name. There's only two of them. So you can guess, but I'm involved with one of them. We've been in discussions for nine months for a prototype for basically doing track and trace of their equipment. And because we cannot demonstrate what the ROI is, 
it's been months and months and months of discussion. So the problem with these technologies from a business standpoint at the enterprise level is nobody wants, because you can't show them an ROI because the technology is not there, it's a catch-22. I'm hoping that they're going to go ahead and have enough vision that they're going to bite off on this and say, well, we're going to throw money at this and hope the hell something happens. You know, that certainly never happens in the United States. There's no forethought in our our economic model. If you don't get an ROI in the next quarter, nobody's going to buy the technology. So nobody in the U.S. is going to bite off on making these investments. The Europeans, I think, have got a little bit longer timeline. And of course, the Chinese, they look at things. How how is this going to pay off in 100 years? And that's why, you know, China's turned out to be the powerhouse it has is because they're willing to make long-term investments. So I think what's going to happen is, as we move forward, as we find vertical market solutions with definitive ROIs, that once that happens and people can see that they're going to get an ROI in their investment, and I'm talking from the greater aspect of business, then you're going to see things really take off. So, And then when I talked about the five to 10 years, I certainly think by then we'll have ROI models and investment models for, for business in the next four to five years. And once that happens, people will start deploying tokenization of assets across all vertical markets. And in 10 years from now, everything will be tokenized and there'll be tokenized cars and wallets and airplane parts and shoes and, and Louis Vuitton bags, which they're always doing and everything else. So the, the it depends on when you're going to be able to have a few people with vision take the risk to invest, not knowing what the return is. Once the return is demonstrated, then it's going to be a floodgate of everybody piling in. So that, I think, is really what I found in the last four or five years, really working hard in the in the in the traditional business space about trying to get blockchain technology implemented is this willingness to make an investment. I'm not talking about an MVP of, you know, five grand. I'm talking several hundred thousand dollars to do an MVP or a proof of concept in the space. And even companies like that that are billion dollar companies, they don't even want to spend that money. They don't want to take the risk. But we're getting close. I think every I think I think as as Bitcoin and 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 other things lead the charge and you've got all these gigantic Wall Street firms now investing, Grayscale Trust, you know, and all these others, you know, Guggenheim and and Mass Mutual Insurance, which all broke really these gigantic sea change in cryptocurrency in uh, late 2020, in 2020, when you started having these billion dollars, Michael Saylor over at MicroStrategy and all these guys start piling in. Then the rest of business says, well, if there's billions of dollars behind this and all these Fortune 500 companies piling in and even buying Bitcoin, maybe now we will consider it. So there was a significant sea change in the market in Q4 of 2020 which now is starting to lead to cracks in risk um, in the next year or two. And I think after we get through that, then I think we'll see a floodgate. It, it's it's going to be when it opens up, it's going to move fast. And we're right at the tipping point, but we're not there yet. I know that wasn't a definitive answer like, well, it's going to uh, be three uh, weeks, four hours. And no, five that's minutes. good. That's it. No, that's good. I that's appreciate, good. appreciate can I, it. Can I ask you a question there, hash rates? Um, uh, from what I was hearing you describe there, you were basically trying to pitch a blockchain solution into a private company and having a discussion with them about ROI for that company. And are you talking there about a a solution that would run you know within that company to manage their own equipment? Is that what you were talking about? Um, it is a blockchain solution. And I, when I use the word blockchain, I only believe in public blockchains. If the blockchain is not public, it's not a blockchain. It's a private database, right? Yeah. And I'm so they, so this particular, yeah, this particular company has already played with internal hyperledger. And I'm like, who cares? Nobody cares. You know, and so right. the idea of using a public blockchain to be able to put their equipment on it scares the shit out of them. Sorry about what, that. What, but, why would they want you, to do that? Um, because of transparency and trust in building relationships with their ex- their ecosystem, right? The blockchain used the word trust. I think I wrote it down. Trust engineering. I okay. say that my 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 word for blockchain is blockchain reduces or eliminates the cost the cost of trust in a transaction. Public blockchains are the neutral arbitrator of business. They are a place that everybody can agree 
to 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 commingle and to exchange information where there is not a bias on the information. If I have a private database or private blockchain, I can manipulate that data to meet my needs. And if you have one, it's the same for you. But if we agree to exchange business data publicly on a public blockchain, it becomes like the referee of business, right? And it brings transparency to business. And this idea yes. of being able to put their business data out in the world like that scares the hell out of them. But they realize if they do it, it brings them to a transparency that is going to it's going to it's going to bring them and make them a leader in the world because they've really opened up. It's just, it's a phenomenal mm. place to be. And we're so close, but we're not quite there yeah, yet. It's a strategic move. They shouldn't be thinking direct ROI on that. For example, long term ROI, but it's hard, you know, because it's we can't prove it. We don't know what it is yet because it's never been done. Mm. Yeah, it's a different paradigm, but I'm so glad that we get to hear all these brilliant thoughts. And that was a, a nice prompt there, Andrew. Appreciate that one. And Zulu, I noticed you might have something to say. You know, we've had a, a really nice conversation this whole time, and we really appreciate you all. We are going to be wrapping it up uh, within this next little bit. So Zulu, um, jump on in and, and say something here uh, that you wanted to, to tell us. Um, with the audio again, so hash rates is, is very, I do agree with him, you know. Uh, we would have uh, tokenization everywhere, anywhere. But as regards the time frame and how the mainstream will be, it's impossible to say, you know, in the crypto world. Uh, you know, half a year ago or a year ago, nobody knew about OpenSea or there were very, very few who, are, who were using it. And right now, just last month, they had huge cuts, you know. And everything, it's possible, you know, nowadays. So as regards... And being just as an observer, uh, I've had some uh, discussion with Nutella Lika, and I was amazed about uh, the development they have in in the project. And you know, cross checking with the, what I knew from the other platforms. I'm, I'm speaking here just for the NFTs. Uh, I was amazed that they are foreseeing all the few possible. You know, this is brilliant. And just to wrap it up, and many thanks for this debate. Uh, it, it was very enlightening for, for me, as I'm not a tech guy, you know. And it was good to hear to hear you. And to hear you well, which is <laughs> quite strange, because uh, you cannot hear me <laughs> very well. So many thanks about it, Giuliano, and for organizing uh, this uh, debate. Yes, indeed. Well, thanks for being here. And we did catch uh, some of that as well. And um, most of it, I would say, I, I was able to hear that. So hopefully everybody else caught that too. Uh, so we thank you, Zulu, for, for joining us and um, sharing about, uh, so you mentioned basically that uh, you're excited for what the Toko platform is has potential to offer. And um, so, yeah, and the, at hash rates as well. Uh, you know, you've, you've you've provided us with a lot of things to think about, as well as Andrew. And I really appreciate the way you guys played off each other um, and hash rates. You know, the fact that you are writing things down and uh, bringing them back up really shows your commitment to this uh, to this discussion. So uh, top notch, everybody and uh, everybody in the audience, I'm sure appreciates it. Anybody watching or listening to this recording. Um, we're going to take a chance just to go back around, make sure that you plug whatever um, you want to plug, websites or other social medias or just any ideas you want to make sure are covered or understood from your from your side of things uh, before we wrap it up. Um, so Andrew from Pirate Party of Australia, not to be confused with Pirate Chain R. Uh, Andrew, why don't you share with us, yes. Uh, we did actually have a bit of a uh, uh, cross debate with the pirate chain folks recently, maybe just the name similarity. But uh, do everybody feel free to just drop in on us. There's, there's the website, pirateparty.org.au, or there's the, um, the Discord server. I'll, I'll, I'll drop the Discord server link somewhere on the thing here and people can, someone can tell me where to drop it and feel free to invite, come and talk. It's an open platform. We're all about transparency and free discussion about whatever. Everything we do is in the open. Every meeting, every policy, it's a you know, full transparency platform. So that's the way. Nice. Feel free to come. Drop it us. in the dr yeah. Drop it in the Tokel uh, IDO uh, IDO chat. 
It's okay. right there just above. Okay, great. And uh, thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for joining us. Um, ha hash rates? Yeah, well, you know, wearing my BPSAA hat, I want to say I'm, I'm excited about Komodo and also uh, what uh, Tokel's doing. I think that the business doesn't have time to, to build these tools and to be able to have a tool set that will allow business to be able to jump on and tokenize their solution or having uh, providers do that, I think is great. So there's definitely need as this uh, technology uh, matures for this type. And so I'm excited for them. Um, on my uh, Etho protocol hat, Etho protocol, we're an open source hosting platform, uh, blockchain, Ethereum uh, fork based. It's ethoprotocol.com and we enable people to decentralize their data and host their data and uh, censorship free and anonymous. So uh, I always say WikiLeaks would be a great customer for us. Um, you know, you can come to us and you don't have to worry about the centralized authorities deciding they don't like what you have to say. So ethoprotocol.com. Right on. Shout outs there. Get, get WikiLeaks over to Etho Protocol. Um, thank you, Hashrates, for joining us. It's, it's been fantastic. And you're welcome back anytime. You know, get in touch with us. Uh, I'd love to know more about what's going on. Uh, also, Zulu, thank you for joining us. Um, is there any other thing you would want to say? Maybe something you're working on right now? Yes, thank you, Giuliano. Uh, we are working uh, together with Wookie uh, from Pirate Chain on an FATES uh, contest, actually. It just ended. And please feel free to, to just drop in on the Pirate Chain Discord and uh, see the amazing arts that uh, were submitted and uh, have your votes on. I will kindly ask Dream Team to just uh, drop uh, the uh, Pirate Chain Discord uh, link. And also visit pirate.black, uh, uh, the uh, Pirate Chain website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zulu. And and we look forward to seeing those artworks and see the uh, results of that contest. And um, yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, to Tokel, Natalika. You mentioned about uh, the process going forward, and soon we will be enjoying the uh, all-in-one application where we can view all of these NFT artworks and also see the potential going forward. Um, so Dream Tim, uh, Thank you for being here. We didn't hear too much from you. Did you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share or if there's any other um, plug that you want to make for any of the socials? Um, no, I mean, thank you very much for posting, for posting this today. I mean, what I would like to say is that um, I'm really fascinated by the numbers in the ITO and the reward plan because yesterday I just did a test transaction. I went and bought with 100 um, KMD, I went and bought some cocoa. I ended up, based on the rewards plan, now to have 3,000 cocoa in total. You know, um, I, I think I bought something like 300, and I'm entitled another 3,000 from the reward plan. So that's pretty crazy if you think, you know, what potential a total has in terms of you know, the whole discussion that you had just now and, you know, the, the emergence of tokenization of all assets as we see it coming up, you know, from businesses and individuals. All right. Yes, Dream Tim, thank you very much. And we are just going to hear from Nutella Luka and we will close out this Tokel talk about the future of tokenization and updates with the Tokel IDO. So Nutella Luka, what else should we know here? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Giuliano, for hosting uh, a Tuckle Talk. Really appreciate your time and efforts that you put into it. And uh, thank you for everyone that's joined. Andrew, thanks for taking the time uh, to participate. I know it's late uh, over in our part of the world there, so I appreciate that. And I really, really appreciate your thoughts and you know from a policy perspective. And obviously, you've got that background there and interest in, in decentralized technologies and blockchain uh, and cryptocurrencies as a whole. So I appreciate the time. And then... Uh, Zulu, um, thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry that it didn't work out too much to get you participating there. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to try again sometime. And then uh, hash rates, yeah, that was phenomenal. That was uh, the first time I've uh, heard heard you speak, I suppose. So I'm going to have to go back and have a have a, a listen to some other uh, discussions that you had because I thought you, you the way you think and and um, 
you know, your thought process and being incredible. So I really appreciate the time for coming on and, and discussing that and having some really good discussions. And I really, I've got a quote here that I wrote down because I thought it was fantastic. Uh, but you said, public Excited. blockchains are the neutral arbitrator of business. And I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that on the wall somewhere. <laughs> Right. Well, excited about what you guys are doing, right? So I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. And then uh, for everyone listening, yep. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you haven't already, then I'd recommend getting over to our website and checking that out and, and seeing what we're doing for the future. Um, as we've kind of touched on throughout here, we're building that decentralized application that's going to be showcasing all the features. We should have that done by the end of the year and we'll be having increment uh, incremental releases as we go. Which will have different features uh, as we bring that out, but that that's really the first, you know, first stepping stone of where we're going as a platform. And from there, it, it's basically trying to facilitate and develop and uh, incubate those projects to to really get a hold of this tokenization thing and blast it forward into the future in different ways, shapes, and forms. So, uh, really exciting uh, place to be in my position, anyway, and to discuss all of those ideas and to try and really, you know understand the concepts of where this is going in the future is, is just makes me really exciting as uh, hash rates kind of mentioned there. So thank you, everyone. Excellent. Well, we're glad. Thank yes. You. Zulu, go for it. Just thank you for everyone. Andrew, amazing hash rates. Absolutely astonished with uh, many things. Yes, indeed. All right, Andrew, yes. Glad to be here. It's been a good discussion. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. And, um, you know, behind the scenes, we have Otto, who's making sure that this live stream is getting broadcast and recorded. And so we thank you, Otto, for the work that you're doing. Um, and everyone else who's joined us whether you're in the audience here or whether you're listening on a different platform or in a recorded format, we're hoping you're, you're doing well. I we hope this was uh, informative. It was um, entertaining, educational, and you know makes you excited about Tocal platform, amongst other things. And so, yeah, we we're looking forward to see the Evolution Tocal platform. Stick around the Tocal Discord to get all the, the latest happenings and conversations surrounding Toco Platform. And we look forward until the next one. For now, I'm Giuliano. We're wishing you all the best. <laughs>